and leader in the American Psychological Association and the practice organization. She's a psychologist in Colorado who has worked for over 17 years in co-located settings, offering services in women's multi-specialty health settings. She frequently teaches for APA and the practice organization, as well as outside organizations, about the benefits of co-location and collaboration with healthcare providers in and outside of integrated care. She also consults with healthcare policymakers, legislators, advocacy groups, and the media. Dr. Coons is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and has held numerous leadership positions with APA and the practice organization. She was the founding chair of the APA Leadership Institute for Women in Psychology and currently serves on the board of directors. I now will turn things over to our speaker, Dr. Helen Coons. Thanks so much for your very kind introduction and I want to welcome all of you to transition your psychology practice to primary or specialty health care. Are these settings right for you? And before we begin, I want to extend my uh, thanks to um, Ms. Congoletti, uh, Luana Bosolo, uh, Barbara Fisher, uh, Jewel Edwins Ashman, and Jolita Perry, all outstanding uh, APAPO and APA um, leaders and staff to produce this program today. So welcome to all of you from around the country. I think most of you will agree that psychologists have been in mental health settings, whether child and adolescent, adult outpatient mental health and substance abuse, or working with individuals with serious mental illness uh, since well into the early last century. What is commonly not known, however, is that psychologists have also been in the range of primary care settings, peds, family medicine, obstetrics and gynecology, internal medicine, as well as specialty settings such as reproductive endocrinology, sports medicine, nursing homes, medical and surgical and radiation oncology, cardiology, surgery, uh, neurology for decades as well. In fact, the APA Division of um, Health Psychology recently celebrated its 38th anniversary. Psychologists started to work in a range of specialty, excuse me, primary care and specialty settings uh, approximately in the early 1970s. We've continued in these settings and now frequently are in executive health, bars, weight-related programs, dental programs, um, uh, sports medicine and physical therapy, and work in niche practice, such as a lot of otolaryngology. So what's been different in the last several years and will be different moving forward? Well, no question about it, healthcare reform brought not only a, a long range of challenges, but an amazing series of opportunities for psychologists to expand uh, and deepen our practice within a range of primary care and specialty health settings and opportunities to keep your individual and group practices outside but collaborate in a more purposeful and intentional way with the broad range of healthcare providers. In addition, we have far more opportunities to develop niche practices in other private and public sectors. Today we're going to talk about what it means to work in primary and specialty healthcare settings, a little bit about the culture and environment of health settings, competencies, training options if you'd like to develop uh, or broaden your competencies for health uh, for work in healthcare, examples of models of co-location and integration, and a broad range of contractual options and issues. I've provided you with a PDF of most of the slides that we're going to review today. However, you'll notice that they don't have the photos and images. I'm sorry for that, but we wanted to give you um, a, a better visual uh, experience, but I'm un un unable to share many of the photos and images for licensing reasons. So, some of you are well aware the Institute of Medicine um, included four major areas of adult and pediatric primary care back in the last century, in 1994 pediatric medicine, family medicine, obstetrics and gynecology, and internal medicine. So that list, I almost always um, invite us to think about adolescent medicine and geriatric medicine. These are also rich primary care settings. We want to take a few minutes and make sure everybody's clear on how we define primary care, an integrated, accessible health care service provided by clinicians who are accountable for addressing a range of the majority of health care needs developing sustained partnerships with patients and practicing in the context of family and community. 
an area where we truly have a biopsychosocial model to look at the broad range of biological, psychosocial, psychosocial and sociocultural factors affecting symptom presentation, assessment, treatment, prevention, and both immediate and long-term care. While we're not going to spend a lot of time on statistics, it's important to remember that over 66% of primary care providers report that they're unable to access outpatient mental health services per patients. I hope you'll agree that that's a, a terrible statistic and it makes me very sad that so many individuals across the lifespan are going without important uh, behavioral health and substance abuse treatment. Interestingly enough, about 70% of mental health services are actually provided in uh, primary care. It's one of the, by primary care clinicians. It's one of the reasons that primary care settings are known as the de facto mental health setting. There's no question there's a long list of benefits of our co-locating and, and integrating our behavioral health services in primary care settings. We know that women in particular like one, the convenience of one-stop one -stop care. Uh, individuals have more trusting relationships with providers, and when we're there, we become a part of that team. For many individuals and families across diverse cultural groups, um, receiving mental health services um, in primary care helps to reduce the stigma. Um, there's a, a certainly a, a benefit of redu reducing the, uh, the lack of parity in insurance coverage when we can deliver behavioral health services right on site. Co-locating and integrating reduces the geographic, cultural, and linguistic barriers. We know that for some populations there's more satisfaction by having co-located and integrated care. And more recently, we have some very interesting cost, set, cost offset and patient outcome data. For example, by integrating care in patient-centered medical homes, by integrating behavioral health care in patient-centered medical homes, we see decreased hospitalizations, decreased emergency department visits, while we see a marked um, series of improved outcomes, diabetes um, uh, adherence, uh, at, uh, breast um, cancer mammography uh, screening, and a series of other improved positive outcomes for both patients and cost. That's about all I want to say about statistics today, but what I did give you is a slide with some of the best sites if you would like to look at summary stats, reimbursement, resources, or join special interest groups related to behavioral health in adult and pediatric primary care. Um, I've given you the organization's names. If you're especially interested in looking at what ha has there is to offer at APA, please go to the Center for Psychology and Health website or the APAPracticeCentral.org website for our own excellent resources um, that you are welcome to download and use yourself or share with other groups. So many of you are on this call, most of you, because you're actively thinking about transitioning your practice to primary care and specialty settings. The question is, are these settings right for you? By the end of this program, we hope that you'll be thinking about whether they're right for you, what type of setting, do you have the competencies for the complex roles, interventions, and ethics of these settings? How will you make this transition or further um, a transition if you've already started, and what are some of the contractual and legal and regulatory issues? So for example, what are some of the work we do in primary care and specialty settings? We help men with diabetes and women with diabetes identify and address barriers to self-managing their illness. We might work with highly stressed women who are overwhelmed by family and career challenges help to reduce the anxiety in a child with stomach pain who's having trouble with a school transition, or assist a widowed man with uh, Parkinson's disease to identify the kinds of support he may need in his home or outside, or run a joint medical appointment uh, group for women who are pregnant and, ha and their partners. Well, we're not going to go into every type of professional activity that happens in either primary care or specialty settings. This is a quick summary of the kind of work we do there. Screening and prevention, collaboration, curbside consults, uh, prevention interventions, assessment and treatment, working with individuals, couples, and families, care coordination, acute mental health concerns, uh, as well as chronic ones, 
um, acute illness management, for example, preparing somebody for a mastectomy, or chronic disease management, individuals with chronic pain, diabetes, heart disease, and crisis management. That might be for a patient or family, the staff on site, or part of the first responders to the community. So there's marked differences between offering traditional mental health care in an individual and group practice in the community and providing co-located and integrated care. And I've given you a slide that shares many of the key differences, such as uh, providing more brief interventions, focusing on prevention and early intervention, and being a central part of an interprofessional team. So part of the issue is, are these settings right for you? They're so different than individual and group practices in the community. We're going to talk about culture, environment, and uncertainty. And I would invite you to ask yourself, are these a good fit for you? So the culture and language of medicine is quite different than our psychology speak. As a psychologist who for 17 years has rotated to women's primary care, uh, reproductive endocrinology, medical and surgical oncology, and chronic pain sites, as well as a traditional primary care setting, in any given hour and day, my language might change. How I speak with the primary care doc is very different than how I might speak with a medical oncologist. Encounters in health settings tend to be action-oriented with specific recommendations, focused on building a relationship, but helping patients move forward or families move forward in concrete ways. There's different boundaries between and across providers. Practice expectations are different than an outpatient psychotherapy. You're really focused on working as a team. So you may see patients, couples, or families alone, or you may see them with other providers and staff including an interpreter. Improving a patient or family's well-being is considered a shared responsibility, not just ours or just the physician. Being in these settings requires an enormous amount of flexibility in your role at any given um, hour, morning, or day. It's often a very much a cons consultative fra framework where you may be doing curbside consults and not even see a patient or couple or family. It requires deep respect for all staff members and professionals at all levels. Certainly, uh, the, the codes of ethics are, are slightly different for healthcare settings compared to our um, codes. And is that okay? And what do you do with that? And there's certainly different standards for confidentiality and documentation. A healthcare environment can be very different than a private office that you've decorated and have 100% control over. They're bright. They're sometimes loud. You may not be able to adjust the temperature at any given time. It may be cool, cold, or pretty warm. And if it really bothers you, you may not be able to furnish or decorate an office that's um, done by other people. Part of that reason is that you may, in any given day, be changing a consult. You may be seeing individuals in a consult room, an exam room, or you may be even doing groups in waiting areas after hours. So it requires an enormous amount of comfort with this kind of variability in the environment. I think all of you will agree that for many decades, but especially the last few years, there's been an enormous amount of uncertainty and um, challenges in the health setting. You have to be able to go with that and find that okay, because in any given um, six months or year, practices can change who runs them, where providers practice, who owns them, the location of the practice, and the availability of space. There's tremendous uncertainty right now in the health system with different priorities and reimbursement challenges. Throughout my 17 years, I've been in probably 10 different settings, and I've enjoyed that. Most of those moves, um, in part, reflect deepening my collaborations in the Philadelphia and Denver markets, but also clearly reflects practices moving to new hospitals shifting staff and health system priorities, and not entirely um, under my control. If you'd like to see outstanding videos about the, the role and work of psychologists, collaborative and integrated work of psychologists in uh, family medicine, obstetrics and gynecology, and geriatrics, I highly encourage you to see the outstanding uh, videos that are um, really exceptionally done and very informative that are on the APA.org website. 
um, you can go to healthpsychologist.integrated.care and you'll be able to download them. I believe you can also pull them off of YouTube and um, they're very helpful uh, for your own education and to share with potential um, offices where you may consider transitioning your, your individual and group practice. So at this point, many of you are thinking about co-location or integration within primary care and specialty settings. Others of you would like to stay outside of those settings, but deepen your, collab your referral networks. It's important to understand the levels of collaboration and integration. This is a SAMHSA slide from 2013 that, while I'm not going to review today, documents the six or so levels of collaboration, ranging from almost no communication to co-located um, and integrated care. Um, many of you will be able to move towards co-located um, uh, collaborations in primary and specialty care and some of you will move towards more integrated models. I invite you, and I've included, included this in your, your PDF, to review this and evaluate where you are now and what your goals are for yourself, your practice, and the potential uh, medical offices that you would like to transition to. So we're going to have our first participant question. OK, the question is, can you co-locate or integrate in hospital-based and freestanding practice settings? Absolutely. So we, um, we have over 5,000 psychologists in uh, VAs and DODs. And there are a subset of psychologists who are actually civilian psychologists, uh, civilian employees in those settings. And certainly federally qualified health centers, I can't tell you we do not have statistics on the number of psychologists who are employed in federally qualified health centers. So we'll hold those aside for a minute. But there's no question that you can co-locate and integrate under a range of contractual models in academic health centers, community hospitals and health systems, <coughs> excuse me, community family practices, private medical practices, both primary care and specialty, school-based health centers, nursing homes, and wellness programs. So there's no question that we're not just talking about private medical practices. I'm going to give you some examples of different payment options. But while I do this, I'd like you to remember that people um, may be moving, colleagues are moving individual and group practices. Their levels of collaboration vary. Um, where they're going varies. So it may be primary care, multi-specialty or specialty. It could be outpatient or inpatient. And um, there, there's huge variability in the size of psychology and medical groups that are doing these contracts. Structures of practice are different, and certainly the employment and contractual agreements. So towards, um, in about 20 minutes, I'm going to go through all those employment options for you. But before I do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about competencies to work in primary care and specialty settings. Throughout this, I would invite, invite you to think about your, kind of, um, your readiness self-assessment, and I'll show you some tools. So you remember the slide of the different areas in which psychologists need to work when they're doing co con uh, collaborative and integrated care? It's important to understand that Integrated primary care interventions are not just shorter traditional mental health care. You're not just moving your outpatient psychology practice or assessment practice into a medical setting. It's a paradigm shift. In 2014, the American Psychological Association uh, published an outstanding seminal article on the competencies for psychological practice in primary care. There were six clusters that you can see on the screen. We certainly don't, we certainly today don't have time to go through all of those. But I thought I would highlight just a few. Do you feel that you can provide evidence-based assessment, evaluation, treatment, and prevention interventions in primary care or specialty settings? Specialty settings such as reproductive endocrinology, cardiology, pediatric neuropsych, bariatrics. Do you have the skills to provide interprofessional consultation and collaboration? Do you understand the range of challenging ethical issues uh, for providers and patients and families in health settings. How about technology? Do you know the different types of ports, 
state-of-the-art genetic counseling in oncology, cardiology, dementia, uh, pediatrics. Um, how insulin pumps work, for example. What kinds of medical procedures patients go through. And standard questions about psychopharmacology and how to collaborate with a range of healthcare providers around medications. Well, it would take me a couple hours to really go through all those clusters. I just thought I would highlight a few examples. It's essential to have um, intraprofessional skills. One of the best parts that um, I so enjoy every day about rotating to different kinds of primary care and specialty settings is the broad range of healthcare providers and other providers that I get to work with on any given day in primary care or specialty settings. I encourage you to take, care, take a look at this self-assessment tool from Dr. Cynthia Ballar from 2001. On, it's a template for assessing your readiness to deliver services to patients with medical surgical problems. Well, we're certainly not going to go through all those, and I suspect it's hard to read on the slide. I thought it was important to give this to you, and you can print it out and think about your own self-assessment, your own readiness to make this transition. Here are two cases that when you have some private time, you can try to take those questions and apply them. For example, if you were interested in moving to pediatric primary care, would you have the competencies to work with a newly diagnosed 10-year-old uh, boy with diabetes? Or if you were going to go to family medicine or internal medicine or geriatric primary care, would you be able to work with a, a woman who has a newly diagnosed dementia of the Alzheimer's type in that setting? So you can take Dr. Bolar's template and go through either of those cases and see how you fare. Do you feel like you're very well prepared? Or do you need to develop um, deeper competencies to work in these settings? So how do you actually go about doing that? Well, we have no way of knowing um, of the, I believe, 250-some participants in today's workshop where you are in your professional, uh, your career trajectory. So I thought I would start uh, with uh, graduate students and, and work through a little bit. So, and we'll talk about practicum placements, pre-doctoral internships and postdoctoral fellowships, re-specialization, how to create a formal self-study, and what it means to have lifelong learning to ensure ongoing competencies for work in the health setting. Here's another participant question. How can someone pre-license earn money in integrated care? Well, this is an excellent question. Um, probably the most important way is to um, make sure that you're doing it, you've had an internship, um, a paid internship, an um, APEC approved internship in a primary care or specialty setting. There are other times when you may be able to do clinical work through grant funding as long as it's supervised. A third, not all work, work for psychologists in health settings are clinical. So you also may be able to pre-license, uh, provide non-clinical services, such as writing grants for the health setting, doing phone outreach, or outcomes research with a, a, a caring reminder that our breadth of clinical, excuse me, our breadth of competencies doesn't uh, just stop at our clinical skills. Here's another participant question. How do I find a good APEC accredited internship in primary care psychology integrated mental health? So um, first you want to see the APEC descriptions of internships and you also then want to review internship descriptions to make sure they include rate rotations, not just a uh, an, an hour a week, but a formal supervised rotation in an integrated primary care or integrated mental health setting. By the way, for those of you who aren't sure about integrated mental health, it's the reverse. It's a mental health setting that brings um, medical providers, physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs. So you would want an internship that has a formal supervised um, rotation. You also would want to talk with um, prior and current interns about their experience to make sure um, apropos of the question, that it's a good APEC accredited program. So what about the many, the most of you who are participating in this um, webinar who have already finished your formal training, your license, and you're out uh, running an individual or group practice? You can create a formal self-study, which you would actually want to um, document. You would want to do formal a formal program, including coursework, 
formal clinical work, you probably want to arrange shadow providers. It's one of my favorite things, and even though I'm a board-certified health psychologist, I still shadow providers. Um, and you would want to create a lifelong learning approach to competency. So there's a long range of educational options, and I'm just going to highlight a few. The first is through our very own APA practice organization. And again, you can see these on apapracticecentral.org. The very well-received healthcare summits, APAPO programs at the APA convention and SPT present, SPTA presentations, such as the, the state convention, and webinars such as the one this morning. In addition, we have the new APA and APAPO CMMI workforce grant, which I'll talk about shortly. In a division, in, excuse me, in addition, there's the outstanding APA Division 38 primary care curriculum. You can receive excellent training at the CFHA annual conference every October. That meeting is actually this, uh, starting probably today um, in Texas. Regular SPTA conferences now routinely tend to have programs on um, integration and in health settings. The Society of Behavioral Medicine annual conference in the spring. And then especially if you want to do work in specialty settings, the smaller focused conferences on any number of topics, infertility, uh, perinatal issues, psychosocial oncology, pain, sleep. So um, let's talk a little bit about some of the course programs. Uh, you have the, um, the new APA.org um, Integrated Healthcare Alliance. And this is an opportunity for you to, without cost, receive expert training on integrated care and receive ongoing support for your practice transformation. This, um, if you want to learn more about this, please see the website on the slide. And this is an outstanding opportunity for um, you to prepare at no cost to transition your individual or group practice. Um, it's you also get a free subscription to the Clinical Quality Outcome Reporting Registry um, and uh, will um, get eight continuing free uh, CEA credits uh, for your participation. And I highly recommend that even if you're a fairly seasoned person in primary care or, or specialty care that you look at this curriculum. A couple of months ago, the uh, new interprofessional seminar, Integrated Primary Care, was also released. This includes outstanding modules on interprofessional care, population health, ethics, leadership in health settings, health finance, and health policy and advocacy. It's an excellent curriculum uh, that came uh, as a result of Dr. Susan McDaniel's uh, presidential initiative during 2016. And again, it is free to you, and I highly recommend it. Um, I also like that um, the, there, it um, infuses a mastery of diversity of um, individual and societal levels to work in very complex and diverse health settings. Another uh, very well-known program is at the University of Massachusetts and at the Center for Integrated Primary Care. And you um, have a slide if you would like to see that year-long program. Um, it's a very well-respected program. In addition, there's one at Fairleigh Dickinson. And this is the 25th, 25th year of Dr. McDaniel's um, intensive course on medical family therapy at the University of Rochester. I believe, that, yes, that program is usually in June and is extremely well received. While most of you will find it hard to do, a few of you will do a postdoctoral certificate in clinical health psychology if you'd like to kind of re-specialize and develop the competencies to work in health settings. There are a few of these programs around the country. They tend to be year-long and include both courses and clinical rotations in medical settings. So that was obviously a very, very, very brief summary of issues around competencies and some concrete ways for you to uh, develop competencies if you'd like to make this transition. Again, I hope that you'll step back and do a readiness self-assessment for competencies. Many of you often ask, well, how do I build these collaborative relationships? How do you actually transition uh, your individual or group practice to a healthcare setting? So again, we're not going to do this collab uh, um, interactively during the webinar today. But if I had you as a group, 
uh, we would be doing an interactive exercise, which you can do um, this afternoon or this evening, which is to list all of your current collaboration, collaborative strategies. What do you do intentionally or purposely now to build your collaborative relationships with a range of healthcare providers? And as you go through this, this presentation, what other strategies might you consider using starting this afternoon? So one of the most important collaborative strategies is hands down sending consult notes. While they are the standard of care for any consultation, and I'll talk more about that shortly, they also are a very powerful way to communicate the kinds of work that you're doing with patients, patients' needs, how you collaborate, um, improvement in patients' outcomes, and a very visible way for providers to um, contact you. An important question is which practice generates the largest number of referrals for you at this time? And can you deepen that collaboration? When you're um, speaking very briefly with healthcare providers about patients or couples or families, do you ever ask them about their own practice or their own interests? Do you refer back? Have you ever asked um, whether they would like, if it's a particularly complex patient um, issue or couple or family, whether it would be helpful to attend a team meeting? Would you consider inquiring about their interest in having you on site to see individuals or offer groups to do joint appointments? Do they know you're available for crisis management um, and as also for patient outcome assessment? I'd like to talk a little bit about the importance of consult notes. Anytime you have a new patient that's physician or other healthcare provider referred, obviously you're asking questions about whether or not they've had a recent physical and labs. It's always an important opportunity and a part of our clinical mandate to provide a formal consult note with consent. This is true also for new patients who are not referred by a healthcare provider. In addition, you can copy that note with consent, not only to the referring provider, but all providers involved in that individual's care. I would say for in, a, in the four new patients I've seen this week, on average, they've had approximately four, a range of four to seven healthcare providers, all of whom will, will receive a consult note from me uh, with a very brief assessment and the treatment recommendations. In addition, you see ongoing patients who may not have healthcare provider contact, but for whom you do need to refer because you're concerned about their blood work, their symptom presentation, um, or any a number of issues. You can also do follow-up letters or calls. For example, when there's a crisis, when someone's affected by national disaster, or there's a death or loss in the family. When seeking a consultation from a psychologist or other providers, Physicians are likely to expect clear statements of observed facts and specific intervention recommendations. So the report needs to be brief. Please include the patient's date of birth since there are many, many patients with the same name in any given health practice. Please do not include the social security number. And you want to give concise treatment recommendations for the patient or the couple or the family. There is no need to include any interpretations in any consult note to a healthcare provider. If you're going to refer them for a second, uh, for a uh, consultation, for example, perhaps for a medication consult from a psychiatrist or psychiatric nurse practitioner, you certainly want to include that individual's name and phone number and include follow-up plans. For example, they, will they be returning for you for, um, for ongoing care? Notes should be relatively prompt, uh, one or two weeks at the latest um, after a visit, um, or you may need to speak with a healthcare provider um, or um, uh, one of their staff. Watch what you say. For all of your consult, our consult notes um, can be released to other providers, um, lawyers, disability review, etc. So you need to consider, um, and certainly consider HIPAA-related issues and forms. Remember that um, most of the email that we use and texting uh, is not um, secure, and so you may want to consider uh, using encrypted email. Um, and as well as an electronic medical record that um, is, has intraoperability, the ability to share with other healthcare providers. I really invite you to look at how you collaborate. 
In addition to taking really good care of providers' patients, are you available and visible and flexible with them? Are you willing to do a curbside or mini consult? For example, if they call saying they're not right, quite sure which direction to go with a patient who's having difficulty with initial and middle insomnia or really struggling with their adherence to um, a three time a day treatment protocol. You can offer to see the patient um, in the provider's office. Would you ever consider doing a home visit with or without the medical provider? Do you discuss and provide referrals? Um, are you actually share, um, in the same health insurance panels that the um, collaborating providers are in? Just a friendly reminder that no one should be doing hospital consults, consults without staff privileges at that hospital. Be generous. Share referrals. Give names and cards of, of uh, colleagues and resources in your community. Do provide outstanding educational pamphlets. For example, the APA has an outstanding brochure on perinatal depression and anxiety. My GYN colleagues have been thrilled with those. In addition, we were able to introduce them to outstanding high quality guided imagery tapes on success, uh, healthy pregnancy successful delivery. Same with our oncology providers who now regularly are aware of using guided imagery tape, tapes for patients getting ready for procedures, um, going through chemo, radiation, um, uh, um, or any number of other issues in that setting. You may be available to recommend or design assessment and screening tools, write grants, um, attend some of their interprofessional meetings, um, and um, any number of other evidence-based articles that we see from our outstanding journals that speak to providing um, behavioral health and substance abuse treatments in health settings. Do offer to do staff training or lunch and learns. I see that I've included holiday lunches. This is the time of the year will, uh, where I will arrange to uh, bring lunch, lunch, catered lunch to probably four or five practices that I either rotate to every week or have very strong referral relationships with. Are you available to either go or give grand rounds? One of my favorite things is to invite providers, uh, way, one of my favorite ways of collaborating is to invite providers to co-present with me. I had the opportunity to meet a new surgeon, a breast surgeon in Denver the other day at her request, and I've already invited her, um, as well as the nurse navigator, to rotate with me to do groups uh, for women with early and advanced breast cancer. She was delighted. It gives her more visibility. It models interprofessional care for patients, and quite frankly, it's a lot more fun. So if you're writing an article for a community journal, you could also invite them to co-author with you and certainly offer to do groups on any number of um, prevention and treatment issues in primary care and specialty settings. So I hope those are some ideas that expand your thoughts about how you might um, build and sustain relationships with any number of healthcare providers um, and staff championships, to, excuse me, staff champions. What we'd like to do now is talk about some innovative practice models. While many of us have been co-located and integrated for decades, more and more many of you are thinking about transitioning your individual and group practice. Some of you want to deepen your referral network but not go on site to health settings. Others of you will consider an independent practice association, what's called an IPA, as well as a management service organization, an MSO. We're going to mostly today talk about co-location and integration, but I really encourage you to look at the APA PO good practice uh, publications, the APA PO web information, um, and other and attend other meetings if you want to learn more about the IPA and manage uh, and M MSO option for your practices. There are excellent articles already on the APA Practice Central website to deepen your fund of knowledge about these options. If you're going to move forward with the transition, you do want to have a great deal of knowledge about possible contracts as well as legal challenges and regulatory issues. So for many of you, you're considering renting or sharing an office with healthcare providers. Certainly there's an outstanding benefit of being invited to meet patients in the moment with warm handoffs and receiving a high volume, but not all, referrals, and that's just fine. 
you want to, um, the, the benefit of this is that you're highly visible and that you become part of the team, even if you're not an employee. So I wanted to talk briefly about the kinds of payment options that are in co-located in integrated health settings. Some of our colleagues are employees and receive a W-2. Others are independent consultants under contract, in other words, a 1099. In my case, and in many of our colleagues, we're independent providers with under in these settings under contractual agreements. Whether you're there individually or as a group, you're independent, you're self-employed, but you're there under a contractual agreement. And that could be, again, for an individual or your group. Other individuals are grant funded from the uh, federal grants, state grants, and foundation grants who are invested in uh, expanding and deepening behavioral health providers in health settings. There have been some special uh, insurance funded initiatives and some of those still exist in some markets across the country. For some of us, we simply are billing under our own practice. There are now newer models where you may become part of the capitated rate for that practice and there's a, PP, uh, a, per page, a patient per patient per month. Um, there are some psychologists who are more likely to be employed in health settings for which their services are part of a bundled payment. What we don't recommend at this time is that you try to negotiate a contract with um, under evaluation and management code. Why that is is somewhat beyond today, but um, I actually have never been able to find anybody, a psychologist at any rate, who has made that um, arrangement um, at this time. That may change in the years ahead, um, and especially if we're ever able to bill for e &M. But right now, it's not a common practice. We have a couple of other participant questions. OK, the first question is, what CP CPT codes can be used in paid for consultative time with a primary care physician or physician extender? Sure, and how do you bill or get reimbursed for warm handoffs on an ongoing basis? Well, these are great questions. Well, remember that slide with all of these different uh, components to our work in primary care and specialty settings? How do we get paid? Great question. Well, there's no one specific answer to that. But um, you have, we, we have a series of codes, both through the traditional psychiatric and psychological procedures, CPT, CPT codes, that you're all familiar with such as the diagnostic and treatment codes, the testing codes, for a few of you, the psychopharm codes, and the crisis codes. For many of us, we also can use the health and behavior codes. This is when an individual does not have a mental health diagnosis. For example, they might come in for um, frustration dealing with uh, their hemoglobin A1C and um, adhering to what's recommended around nutrition and exercise. Or they may come in uh, Oh, with a new diagnosis of um, a, um, let's see, a, um, a cancer, but they're in fact coping very well. We can bill in 15 minute intervals using the health and behavior codes. The first one is for the initial assessment, then for the reassessment, and then there are four intervention codes, depending on whether you're seeing an individual, conducting a group, working with a, pa a family where the patient is there or working with a family where the patient is not there. So the most common um, for a warm handoff is to really use the 15-minute um, health and behavior code. And to answer your question, um, I think it's fair to say that APA and other groups are working hard with um, the AMA and other groups to establish more CPT codes that reflect the kind of collaborations that happen in health settings. And I'm hoping in the, the next year and, or year and a half that we will see a richer set of codes that reflect more of a, a collaborative and less siloed psychiatric procedural versus health behavior set. Uh, if you would like to learn more about codes at this time, I do suggest you look at uh, Dr. Puente, uh, Dr. Antonio Puente, the APA president, uh, website psychologycoding.com. And I believe many of you can access an outstanding a webinar that was done a few months ago on coding through the APA practicecentral.org. 
let's talk a little bit um, about some of the contractual issues if you're starting to negotiate for on-site collaborations and integration. Perhaps the biggest part of this is to clarify expectations, your own and those of the practice. How much time do you want to be there? Well, let's talk about time. They're going to ask you how many sessions do you want. A session in a medical setting is not what we think of a session. A session in a medical setting is a four-hour block of time, typically from 8 to noon um, or 1 to 5, or sometimes from 5 to 8 if the office has evening hours. So in a contract, you're negotiating uh, for your time per session, not our 45-minute hour or 20-minute session. What, your state, what are your space needs? Are you going to be doing testing and needing a desk? Do you need access to computers? Who will be doing patient scheduling? Will you be calling the patient if you haven't met them in a warm handoff, or will they be scheduling? Um, who owns the records? Uh, what kinds of referrals will be made? Do you understand that they can refer to you, but they can refer to other providers as well, and you can actually help with that? That you may not be listed on their signage or letterhead, but that you can, in, on a card, list the address. That you can create, while well, there are proprietary issues, both for medical practices and your own individual or group practices, that there's many mechanisms to collaborate. And what will happen if you're co-producing an event, who will be responsible for public relations and advertising. So remember a rental, if you have a, a form, you certainly will want to have a contractual ish, uh, agreement. If that includes a rental agreement, time or for four hour blocks, will you be um, using a consult room, an exam room, will it rotate depending on the number of providers and availability that day, and where will you conduct groups? There needs to be a mechanism for warm handoffs and how providers will give patients your name um, and or how providers will give patients, um, um, uh, how they'll give your name uh, to call patients. Remember there is no fee splitting. Um, you do not, oftentimes um, in the many consultations I do per week on this matter, I still get uh, psychologists asking me, well, um, they want to uh, take a percentage and you get a percentage. That is um, illegal and what you want to learn about the Stark laws and is highly relevant to the contractual agreements that you'll, gener that you'll um, be entering into. So um, it's important to negotiate computer access. Uh, for example, uh, are you using an electronic medical record that's on the web? Are you going to negotiate a way that um, you can legally uh, write notes in their EMR, um, or are you using another mechanism? Also, in this stage, I don't know about you, but probably at least six times a day, I'm going on site with a patient to looking at resources, to looking at their logs, whatever the example is. You need to have computer access one way or the other. It's important to be very clear well, who will own patient records, uh, what kind of access you will have. Um, to their EMR or will you use your own and what content is shared. There are some practices that do their own note but it's downloaded and it's scanned and downloaded right to their EMR. Other individuals have been able to document in the practices um, electronic medical records and others keep records very private. It's important as you go through these contractual um, conversations that you understand um, who owns the practice? Are they a privately held medical group in the community? Is the group um, held um, by an, um, an, an accountable care organization? Is it owned by a health system? Or are they public? And so it's important to understand who is it that you're negotiating with. You very much may have a, a physician champion who wants to bring you on, but they may not be in the position to do the, negoti the contractual negotiation. There's no question that some of you are interested in building your, your referral network, but not necessarily transitioning on site. Independent practice is not going to vanish anytime soon, but it may be very different. We do have consumer choice, uh, where there's a need to have long, a long standing relationship and treatment uh, for their uh, mental health and, and medical issues. They may want to choose a behavioral health provider in the, in the community. They may want somebody with a different theoretical orientation. 
and many of our patients have had past experience with therapy and have some insight into what's helpful. That if so if you're not interested in making this transition, you also can work in a very intentional or focused way to deepen your referrals from medical practices, patient-centered medical homes, accountable care organizations, schools, and employers. When an organization has become a patient-centered medical home, they may not necessarily have on-site behavioral health providers, but they do need to document their ability to coordinate mental health referrals, or they do both. They have on-site and they do referrals. And many of you in individual and group practices in rural and in urban and, uh, community practices are well positioned to deepen those referrals, whether or not you go on site as well. I highly recommend whatever your contractual questions are and whatever path you take, you seek legal consultation from a health law attorney, not your estate attorney, not the divorce attorney, not a real estate attorney, a health law attorney who has deep understanding of the complex legal, regulatory, um, contractual, and federal and state issues that affect our ability to work in health settings. It's also important that you secure liability and property insurance. This is not a tough thing to do. Once you know you're going on site to a primary or specialty care setting, or you are more inpatient or outpatient setting, you contact your liability and property insurer carrier and designate an other. And I might add that it's not very expensive. So what we'd like to do is deepen a little bit of the conversation about the, the opportunities you have for consultation from the APAPO Office of Legal and Regulatory Affairs. So I'm going to turn the, the webinar back for just a few minutes to Connie Galetti. Thank you, Dr. Coons. And I don't want to take up a whole lot of time, but I did want to use this opportunity to let you know how our department has been involved with integrated care, co-located care, and alternative payment uh, practice models. So, for example, we work with state psychological associations with their advocacy efforts when it comes to laws that might serve as barriers to practicing in these settings. There are some state laws that don't allow psychologists to work with other healthcare providers in a general uh, corporation, for example, because only a physician can practice medicine and a corporation cannot. So we've been able to work with some of these state laws to broaden that. Um, by allowing them to form professional corporations or by tweaking the law to allow them to partner more easily. Um, we also work with them on scope of practice issues and reimbursement issues. Um, we also uh, work very closely with an outside legal firm to uh, help psychologists understand the nuances behind integrated care and how that might impact their practice, um, including making sure that they are staying a pri you know, in keeping with the laws, including the Stark laws and anti-kickback laws. One of the benefits of APA membership and APAPO membership specifically is that you have access to a lot of these materials that we've already developed. So I encourage you to go to the APA Practice Central website or reach out to us in legal and regulatory affairs with specific issues and we'll do what we can to assist you with your individual issues. Uh, on this slide, we do have a link to some of our resources and I encourage you to visit them uh, because we've compiled so much information that we believe will be very helpful as you consider these different approaches to practicing. Uh, uh, finally, uh, we do, uh, as I mentioned before, we are available as a resource to answer specific member calls. We, we do not give legal advice here, but we do have a lot of knowledge uh, to guide you um, and to help you ask and the questions that you need to ask. And then we might be able to help you find an attorney in your jurisdiction to help you uh, get official legal advice, especially when it comes to contracting and uh, setting up practices in different settings. Dr. Coons, I'll leave it to you. Thanks so much. That's a great update and um, so deeply appreciate all the amazing efforts of the APA staff to bring us um, timely and state-of-the-art 
consultation and, and uh, contractual information about um, transitioning practices uh, for co-location and integration, as well as other integrative, innovative practice models. So also just another friendly reminder about the new APA and APA PO um, Integrated Healthcare Alliance, where you can get free uh, training and ongoing support. So I think it's pretty clear that, that a con developing a contractual relationship with a, a health practice is really about negotiation. It's about taking your time and knowing who the key players are, not just the physician champion, but who owns and runs that practice. So if I can say one thing, go slow and really develop excellent relationships and communication and create a, a good collaborative foundation. Um, the, the contract shouldn't just be an add-on. It should be a very thoughtful, methodical um, process that, that works for both you and the practice. Everybody should feel good about it. Do consider shadowing providers to see um, both to learn from them, understand how they practice, and see whether or not it's going to be a, fit, a good fit. Bottom line, focus on the needs of the health practice and their patients and families. So there's a lots of, there's, we have a long tradition of working in primary care and specialty settings, both in inpatient and outpatient venues. Um, and many of you um, really uh, will enjoy the opportunities that are there. You can continue to do what you're doing, or you can um, move and methodically um, seek out some of these opportunities to uh, broaden, deepen, and sustain your collaborations. So from 2018 to 2020, are you going to stay in the same locations, or do you want to go into healthcare, adult or pediatric primary care, or niche practices? Or do you want to stay outside of the health settings, but really develop much more formal collaborative referral relationships? Or are you really about seeking uh, uh, business opportunities in other public, public and private settings, organizations, communities, or countries? So as we close this more formal part of today's webinar, I'd like you to, I'd invite you to think about business tips for successful psychology practices. Are you intentional about sustaining collaborations with your referring colleagues, companies, organizations, and groups? Or do you need to step back and think about how to be more intentional um, and, and go about deepening those relationships? As you think about your business plan for your individual or group practice, I hope you'll focus on your passions and strengths. Think about not just reducing costs, but how do you diversify your income streams? What are the trends, both in our country and in your communities, that um, clearly we have an important role to bring evidence-based uh, assessment uh, treatment and prevention strategies and can really make a difference for both individuals, couples, families, and communities and improve health outcomes at all levels. What is your growth portfolio for the next couple of years? Or are you actually happy just sustaining where you are? And that's okay, but for many individuals, you'd like to develop intentional and, and develop an intentional innovative business plan. We hope that this first hour of transitioning your psychology practice to primary and specialty healthcare settings has been helpful and that you're more reflective about whether these settings are right for you, uh, your readiness to make this transition, if you have the competencies or how to go about developing them, and some of the contractual and legal and regulatory issues. Thank you for your thoughts, and we're, I'm very happy now to, um, I, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to present this quick hour to you, and now am, uh, would like to turn the program back to Ms. Galetti. Thank you, Dr. Kins. Yeah, and we have a few questions typed in. Um, I would remind everybody that you are still in listen-only mode, so if you have additional questions, please type it in the box. The first question is, how can we propel training in integrated healthcare in doctoral programs? Well, that's an excellent question. I, I think we that, that has, has begun, perhaps not at the pace and at the depth that we'd like across doctoral programs, but we do see far more a PhD and PsyD programs, and programs offering curriculum um, and offering practicum uh, rotations in health settings, whether it's family medicine or oncology rotation or a community homeless center or school-based health. In addition, one of the reasons the Division of Health Psychology developed the outstanding curriculum for graduate students is that there are a subset of PhD and PsyD programs where faculty don't have 
the, um, the expertise that the cells. So there needed to be curriculums that could be put into um, doctoral programs. And I think that that's, a, an out, that's been an outstanding uh, benefit for many programs who are trying to catch up a little bit. I hope that answers the question and we anticipate um, or hope for continued curriculum reform for health settings and other areas in our society where we have so much to bring as psychologists. Thank you, Dr. Coons. Our next question, and I, I think you touched on this earlier in your presentation, but perhaps you can expand on this. Do you have any insights, suggestions, or guidance as to marketing integrated behavioral health services to primary care physicians? Uh, indeed. So I am of the, the strong bias that the best place to start are with the healthcare providers who are and practices who already uh, collaborate most closely with you now. And that that is really the place to start those conversations. And that when you develop successful collaborative and integrated practices with them, their colleagues in the community will hear about them. You can also ask them to make an email or phone introduction to other healthcare practices so that um, they may also be um, up, um, practices where people could expand to as well. I don't recommend many cold calls to practices unless you're in rural settings. I might add that in many states or can work counties, depending on the some of the new grant funding, there'll be much more interest among community integrated, excuse me, among community primary care settings to integrate behavioral health services. And so there's a lot of opportunity. You may also be able to um, attend some interprofessional meetings and develop relationships. And you certainly can develop that um, market by um, your good care and by inviting colleagues to present or write with you. So that's, um, do I think that many healthcare providers are looking at your websites, going out and just looking? Probably not too much, but they do ask their colleagues who's out there and who they should refer to. And so your best, in many respects, your best way of marketing is the quality of care you deliver, your ability to communicate that, that care, your ability to be visible and present, and your ability to be collaborative, and sometimes just to ask other people to open some doors for you. Thank you. We have another question. What might be a preferred structure and flow to the behavioral services and their coordination with primary care in the primary care setting? Well, that's a, a big, it's a wonderful question and it's a big question and it's a complicated question because, um, and, and while you've heard that I've done co-located care for 17 years, I've also been in settings during the 17 years where I've been fully integrated as well. Um, and actually, even when I'm doing co-located care, it doesn't look very different than my, in, my integrated settings. So there is no one model for pathways to um, warm handoffs and referrals in co-located and integrated care. So I don't have one answer for you. I, I think it's very helpful if you look at some of the SAMHSA resources, some of the excellent books by our colleagues, Chris Hunter and Bob Meyer. Um, who can talk about different models or different structures. Don't forget that medical primary care medical practices, peds and adult primary care, are very different in how they operate, who staffs them. Some are physician heavy, some are PA and nurse practitioner heavy. Some of them have more resources with medical, medical assistants, uh, residents, medical students, uh, nutritionists, pharmacists, and others are, we're talking one or two physicians or nurse practitioners and a a medical assistant and a receptionist. So there is no one model. Um, and part of the answer to your question is that that's the fun part of developing with the practice that you're, you're co-located or integrated in. Um, and having conversations about what is the best flow. And those conversations should include the front desk staff who play an integral role in the flow of patients to you. Some of it involves using technology also because the provider needs to, to let you know that they need you to come in and do a warm handoff. Is it an emergency or not an emergency? Can the patient wait for half an hour or do you need to change what you're doing? And some of that's done with a good old-fashioned knock on the door. Some of that's done with a text. 
some of that's done with another type of communication gadget in primary care. So I'm sorry I don't have one answer for you. In, and it's actually kind of a, the focus of a whole webinar in and of itself that we can certainly do. But um, it's the fun part of developing a formal and successful interprofessional collaboration and integration. Thank you, Dr. Coons. We have another question related to billing. Um, okay. Can H and B codes be used for consultation with a family on how to manage behavioral challenges for a loved one with advanced dementia? Um, yes, as you, that's an excellent question. And as you, um, you may have heard, when I went through the four H and B intervention co codes, health and behavior intervention codes, one of them is for um, an intervention with a family with the patient present, and the other one is H&B uh, uh, intervention with the family, but the patient is not present. So you have two options there, um, and, and actually for many of us, a common type of uh, role in primary, adult primary care. Okay. This question, um, is, has anyone conducted a survey of medical providers to get a sense of demand for psychological service integration? Are we aware of any? Hmm. Um, so yes, uh, there are several surveys, and I don't have the citations with me. Um, I noticed on the um, Agency for Health Quality and Research, there was a reference, um, SAMHSA probably, um, you might want to look at the Journal of Family, Collaborative Family Healthcare to see if there's any recent articles. Um, you saw the data that I cited early in the, in the webinar on the difficulty that um, primary care providers have in making outside referrals. So we know there's a strong need. Um, what I can't do right here is give you an exact citation. Uh, but we, and if you're a member of Division 38, um, or the APA PO practice, um, you, you would be, um, oh, you can put it on the, the listservs for Division 38, for PEDS site, for the APA practice organization, and you may get some immediate citations. If you have trouble finding that citation, please back channel me and I will uh, help you. Actually, the other place would be to look at the APA uh, Center for Psychology and Health. One of the briefing sheets may have that reference for you as well. Well, I don't see any other questions being typed in. Um, may I address one that I, two that I didn't do directly? Please. Sure, I, I spoke to this indirectly, but there were two questions about um, our colleagues being especially interested in integrating in cardiology practices and pediatric neuropsych. And a, a question of like, well, is that possible? Absolutely. That's an out, those are outstanding areas. We talk a lot about integrating in primary care, both pediatric and adult primary care. But, and I've really enjoyed my time in women's multi-specialty, women's um, uh, uh, primary care, uh, obstetrics and gynecology, and general internal medicine. But it's a blast also to be in specialty settings. It's very rich work or with um, patients and families who often have even less access to good psychological um, interventions. So, for example, I've spent a good part of my life not just in reproductive endocrinology and OB, but um, in uh, urogyne and in medical and surgical oncology. So those of you who are interested in something like pediatric neuropsych, or cardiology, or bariatrics, um, there really are no limitations on the kinds of innovative uh, health settings where you may want to um, co-locate or integrate. And I strongly encourage you, if you're already getting referrals or you know that they're looking, to um, approach those practices about um, either full-time or part-time uh, services on site. So that, those are excellent questions. Uh, we did get a couple more, Dr. Coons, if you're ready. Um, Absolutely. Also, in reference to the earlier question about the use of H and B codes for a person with advanced dementia, does it matter that the patient is unable to participate in the behavior management because of their advanced dementia? Um, so, I would suggest you look at 
the um, definition of the health and behavior um, fa intervention code fa with family, um, with a, without patients, and look at the criteria to answer that question. But there are going to be times when patients can't participate, they may be dying, where you're working with the family, and those are appropriate use of, of um, health and behavior codes as well. Thank you. Uh, another question. Do you have a resource for consult note templates? Um, <laughs> on many of the ele uh, electronic medical records, um, you can download a template and edit it if you'd like, if you're using an electronic medical record. Um, which is extremely helpful. If you're not able to contract to use theirs, and there's a there's a complicated set of legal issues around that if you're not an employee or an independent contractor. Um, if you can't use theirs, and you're using an electronic medical record that's in the web that you can use from any office, there's usually templates on there. There are templates in the long list of APA books on integrated uh, um, services in health settings, in pr primary care and specialty settings, there's usually templates there. Um, I sometimes, if I'm not uh, documenting in the practices, um, in the health practices, EMR, I've designed my own. Sometimes I've done a traditional consult note. I'm sorry I didn't include an example of a short consult note today. It was a little bit beyond um, our, our time. But it's a brief note. Um, I some page, Sometimes we've used a checkoff with um, you know, so there's, and there's also some commercial ones that are available. Um, but, so I hope that answers the question. We might, um, you might want to ask some of your colleagues who are direct, already in these settings what they use as well. There's no one uniform note. Okay. Um, another question just came through is, which electronic record software do you recommend for psychologists? Um, APA practice organization does not recommend any particular vendors. We don't endorse products, but we do have some resources about what um, is available out there. So you're welcome to email me directly at cgaletti at apa.org. Uh, but Dr. Coons, do you have any uh, feedback on that? I really don't. I think it's, uh, I don't want to endorse a product per se. If you want to personally back uh, back channel me, I'll tell you what I use for my my practice, but uh, there's an awful lot out there and I the one thing I would say without naming products is that in this day and age it sure should have interoperability and encrypted communication um, um, mechanisms so that you could easily send an email that's encrypted um, and that you can easily communicate and simply Forward. If you're not if you're not in their EMR, you're you're having interoperability. Um, we live in a global world with rapid communication, and I know that if you are starting out looking at electronic medical records, uh, I think those are those would be too high on my list. Um, I don't know if you want to uh, add criteria, but I, I don't think I want to. I don't think it's um, okay to. I don't want to endorse a specific product either. Right. And it also it depends on your needs really. And how you operate. I do. I think the third uh, interoperability, encrypted email, and the third thing is for me. I know I needed to have something that was web-based that I could be any place I wanted to and do a consult note. Since my my practice and my colleagues have rotated to different medical offices over the years, so we wanted to be able to. If we weren't going to be using their, if I'm not going to be able to use their EMR, I sure want to be able to use mine any place and every place. An APA practice organization has written articles on that. If you go to our website, uh, you should be able to find some resources as well. Another question came in, Dr. Coons. Can you let us know of some resources available for evidence-based psychotherapeutic interventions applicable to pediatric primary care? Um, absolutely. Uh, so remember that slide that I gave that had, I don't know, uh, 10 or 11 uh, places to go for for uh, statistics and outcomes. I would start with any of those. Uh, the APA Center for Psychology and Health, I believe, has a pediatric uh, 
a, a briefing sheet on pediatric outcomes. Um, being a, a, there's a very robust listserv and set of resources for the Division of Pediatric Psychology. I, um, that uh, I don't do ped psych and I'm not a member of that division, but I've seen materials from that. So um, those would probably be where I'd start for sure. Um, putting a call out for on some of our Division 38 listserv, uh, the CFHA West listserv, the SPM primary care SIG. I think you'll find that there's, um, and then several of the new publications from APA on psychologists and uh, on, on behavioral health interventions in primary care settings, you'll see some outstanding citations. Terrific. Well, this appears to be all the questions. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Coons, for that excellent presentation. Um, as a reminder, we will send a recording of this webinar to everyone who registered. Members of the practice organization can access additional resources about starting or growing your practice at our website at apacentral.org. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you everyone.